thank you and welcome everybody to today's uh, preview of Open Reviewers Workshop. Um, today we're running our workshop in collaboration with the Open Science Community Iraq. And we have a, a member of the community here with us today who's going to say a few words about the Open Science Community Iraq if you're interested in getting to know them more or joining their community. And with me today is uh, my fellow um, facilitators, Lamis and Femi. Um, Lamis and Femi are members of our um, Champions Program. I'm very happy to have them with me today to help facilitate this workshop. So we are recording today's workshop, um, but please be aware that we are not going to record any of the breakout rooms, and we're also not going to record any of our group discussions, so I will be pausing the recording during those parts. So the recording will just be up to date's presentation, and this will be made available on Preview's YouTube channel later for anyone who's not able to join today. So my name is Vanessa. I am Head of Community at Preview. Um, my background is actually in applied and professional ethics. Um, I live in Oxford in the UK. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I'm just going to pass over to my fellow facilitators to say a few words of an introduction. Hey, so hello, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy to be with you today. So I'm Lamisa al -Khair. I am a medicinal chemist, a pharmacist, and also a lecturer at the University of Khartoum in Sudan, and uh, I'm uh, specializing in drug discovery for neglected tropical diseases. I'm also the co-director and the training lead at the African Reproducibility Network. And uh, as Vanessa said, I'm a pre-review champion, and I'm so proud to be so. And I'm also a wife and a mom to a six-year-old uh, boy. And it's really nice to be with you here. Thank you so much. And our other facilitator today is Femi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Femi Urbanadi. It's nice to be here with all of you. Um, I'm a microbiologist and a public health instructor. So I am a core open site advocate on the community before it's by Nigeria. So it's good to have you on this workshop. Thank you very much. And just to say a couple more words about our Champions Program. So our Champions Program is a, an annual cohort program that we run at Preview. Um, this is the first time we've run it. So these are our first champions uh, this year round. This is our pilot program. And um, we're really happy to have 20, we have I think 20 champions um, from around the world who are all very dedicated and uh, committed to open science and improving particularly uh, peer review practices around the world, making the peer review process more transparent and equitable and inclusive of different communities. Uh, so we're very happy to have um, our champions here with us today. Um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, today's workshop is also co-hosted with the Open Science Community Iraq, um, and they are um, a, a community well, actually, I'm going to just pass directly over to Dr. Sarwan to tell you all about it. <laughs> I think he can articulate it far better than I can. And so, Dr. Sarwan, over to you. Thank you, Venetia. Thank you, Venetia, for, uh, for this nice presentation and nice uh, workshop uh, about uh, open science community Iraq. Uh, the open science community Iraq is, uh, is a place uh, for newcomers and ex experience research to in its instructor. Uh, encourage the open science uh, vertex in uh, value and research, provide feed feedback on uh, velocity. Also, uh, uh, we in, uh, in uh, Open Science Committee Iraq, uh, Open Science Committee uh, Iraq, uh, uh, we we uh, we we learn the some peoples and Iraqi peoples how uh, how how research and is do is, is done and uh, how uh, researchers work together. Also, we help uh, more people and more students for choose journal for uh, uh, how can publisher how can uh, what the scientific publisher. Uh, so we are uh, co co collaboration with the with the with the peer peer review for uh, achieve this uh, workshop. Uh, in the last, I um, would like to th 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 would like to thank. Uh, my dear friend uh, Venetia and uh, all uh, Mampar in uh, uh, peer review. Thank you and have a nice time. Venetia, Vanessa, no sound. You're, on, you're on mute. Of course I am. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Salwan, for, uh, for the introduction. Um, and if you would like to learn more about Open Science Community Iraq, 
Uh, Femi has kindly posted some links into the chat for you to explore there. Uh, one is the link to their website and the other is also the link to their pre-review club page. Uh, so you can contact the club there if you'd be interested in um, doing some preprint reviews with them. Um, you can also learn more about pre-review clubs in general. We'll have some links for you to, to explore more about that on your own at the end. Um, but pre-review clubs are preprint uh, reviewing clubs that get together collaboratively to review preprints. They can form on any sort of uh, basis. So it might be um, in a specific institution, a language, a geographical area, a subject discipline, uh, whatever you want to gather folks together around um, to review preprints. So if that's something you'd be interested in either joining one of our existing clubs, such as the Open Science Community Iraq, or setting up one of your own, uh, you can explore that. So before we get our actual workshop content underway, there are some group agreements to just go through today. Um, so our workshop here today follows the Chatham House rule, and this means that anyone is free to use any of the information from today's discussion, but please do not reveal um, who said any particular comments, so please do not give any attributions to any particular comments. Please do feel free to eat, stretch, step away as much as you need to during the two hours of today. We will have a five minute break in the middle, but it's still quite a long time, so feel free to, to step away if you need to. If you have questions at any point, please write these into the chat. Or you can also use the raise hand function on Zoom and we'll ask you to unmute. Please do add your name and pronouns or how you'd like to be addressed into the Google document. Um, this is our shared notes document for today, but we will not share this publicly with anyone outside of this call. Um, only the recording will go on top of the YouTube channel. If you are someone who is comfortable talking a lot, uh, please try to make space for others, especially in our breakout sessions today, who may be a bit less comfortable chatting than you. Um, please do also be open to, curious about, and respectful of other people's opinions and experiences. And on that note, uh, it's also important that everybody's on the same page in terms of what behavior is expected and acceptable and what is not tolerated in this workshop. So please do make sure that you use welcoming and inclusive language, provide feedback that's constructive, be respectful of different viewpoints and experiences, gratefully accept con constructive criticism yourself, and please do show empathy towards your fellow participants and community members. If at any point today you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome in today's call, we do have ways in which you can report this to us. So you can either send a direct message to me, Vanessa, uh, during the call. You can send an email to report at preview.org, or we also have an optionally anonymous um, incident report form that you can fill in. And all of the reports will be handled with, discre uh, with discretion by Preview safety team. Okay, um, so just a couple more slides and then Lemise is going to take us uh, through the start of it. Our primary goal today is to just facilitate conversations and make space for some collective learning. This is, of course, a taster session, so it's kind of like a condensed version of our fuller uh, open reviewers workshop. Um, so we don't expect that anything momentous, no momentous change is going to happen in the course of this two hours. However, we hope that it's a starting point for you to plant some seeds uh, and to bring us a bit closer to a more equitable and open scholarly uh, evaluation ecosystem. So my hope is by the end of this workshop that you'll have learned more about who we are and what we do at Preview, gained a general understanding of how systems of oppression manifest in the manuscript review process, and learned some strategies to self-assess and mitigate bias in the context of peer review. If you want to make any notes during today's workshop, um, you can find a dedicated space for this on page two of the shared notes document, and we can all contribute to these notes uh, during the workshop. And you should find that unless you are assigned into Google, um, you should find that these notes are anonymous, so we will be able to know who has written uh, what particular note. And a little bit about pre-review before we go forward. So our work is to support uh, our mission to bring greater equity and transparency to scholarly peer review. And this comes under three pillars, the central pillar of which is our open and collaborative infrastructure for our participation in preprint review. And this is a place where any researcher with an ORCID identifier can create an account and provide constructive feedback to preprints. We do this alongside increasing diversity and bringing more equity to peer review by providing training such as this, primarily to early career researchers, but also open to researchers of any stage because we're aware that people don't often get training in peer review. And then also on, um, alongside this, we provide um, places where people can engage collaboratively to review preprints. So we run our live reviews. 
and these engage researchers around the world in collaboratively reviewing uh, preprints together um, in a Zoom call such as this. And we'll have an opportunity at the end where if, if you would like to sign up to our next live review, you're able to do so. So with that said, I have a little bit of information about pre-review. I will move on now into getting to know each other a little bit. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Lemis for our first exercise of today. Um, and I, if you would like, I can stop screen sharing. You can take over at this point. Yeah, yes, please. So I hope you guys can see my screen now. Yes. And yeah, so again, it's so lovely for me to be with you here and for me to start this session. And as we always do, we'd like to start by an icebreaking exercise where I would like to ask all of you to look at these pictures uh, in front of you from one to uh, 10. And I want you to uh, put in the chat or maybe unmute and say which picture of these uh, represent uh, the current uh, idea of peer review in your minds. Does certain picture speak to you and you feel like this picture truly does represent a uh, peer review uh, or not? Uh, again, you can use the chat. Okay, we have one and six. Okay, and we have seven. Okay, anyone else? Six. Okay, so we have two six so far. <laughs> That's nice. So would any one of you would like to unmute and, and explain why they, they've they chose this number? Or maybe you could also write it in the chat. Okay, we have seven again. So I think, interesting, interestingly, for me, it's always eight. Uh, I feel like it's a bit of a, you know, process that's not so clear, but it's it's nice to see uh, people who think that uh, seven uh, also represents it. I see a lot of seven and I see six. Okay. Uh, so in case uh, no one uh, would like to speak, I think we could move to the next part. Okay, so let's start by uh, knowing what do we mean by peer review. So peer review according to Wikipedia is uh, the evaluation of work done uh, by one or more people with similar com competencies to the ones that produced the work and it functions as a form of self-regulation by qualified members of a profession within a relevant field. So this is the, the general um, definition of, of peer review. And it's it's mostly viewed as a black box. You know, it's, it's uh, a, 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 a writer or an author submits a manuscript for peer review the whole peer review process is done uh, behind closed walls and behind closed doors, we don't know. And either the outcome is either the paper is accepted for publication or it's rejected, uh, or the the uh, the authors are asked to uh, write, uh, to, to rewrite the paper or do more experiments or do more modifications. So this is the general idea of what peer review, I think, and what it means to, to most, uh, most of the people. So I'd also like to share this comic with all of you. And I, I would also like to ask you in the chat, what, what does it imply? What do you think about this comic? Again, feel free to use the chat or unmute. Uh, and say, like, what, what do you think when you look at this at this picture? So it's uh, a scientist holding a manuscript and on the path to getting their paper accepted. 
uh, but would anyone care to describe like the scene? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a pretty common comic, uh, Muhammad, that's used to describe the process of peer review. Yeah, a PhD student defending his dissertation. It could be. What else? Like, what, what do you think of the other people standing on the way? Does it like bring any? Yep, obstacles. Exactly, exactly. Dua. Uh, it's it's obstacles. Uh, does anyone else would like to share? Yeah, it shouldn't feel like this. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, the committee. And and exactly what you said is is exactly true. So it's it we could say that this represents the path that an author or a researcher need to go through in order to uh, achieve the final goal of getting published. And this path is not an easy one. And as as uh, Marianella said, sorry if I pronounced it wrong, but it shouldn't be this way. And and what we can see is that the past is full of people holding obstacles and holding weapons um, uh, uh, and, and pointing it towards that uh, scientist. Uh, so they're trying to make their journey hard while we can see that this scientist is unarmed. They only have their manuscript. So there's an imbalance of power uh, that we can see. We could also see that mostly uh, the people who are holding the weapons, uh, or we can view them as the reviewers here, they are white males. So there is no uh, representation of other um, demographics uh, in, in this picture. Uh, so I think this this is unfortunately the, the story now for uh, for most people when it comes to peer review. Uh, when if you want to get your paper published, you have to go through a lot of obstacles that is created by the reviewers uh, and by the journals. And again, um, this is th this shouldn't be the case. It should be uh, it should be easier than that and better than that, and shouldn't be a scary or difficult uh, pathway. Dua is said, but that would make the research stronger. Well, well. We will see that this is not exactly true most of the time, because there have been many cases where even though it's said that the research has been peer reviewed, uh, eventually it comes out with, with many issues and it has to be retracted. And I think the research could be stronger without uh, having the researcher to go through such a traumatizing experience. It could be done in, in, a, in, a, in a better way and in a nicer way that actually helps the researcher build that confidence instead of uh, bringing them down. Okay, so uh, for the sake of time, we'll move on. I, I love the discussion in the chat. So uh, what we see with the current peer review system is that it's inequitable and unsustainable. So it has many flaws, okay? It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's has, it, the pool of reviewers is small, so they're, they're like a selected few that are granted this privilege of being a reviewer. And uh, and, and this also, instead, uh, also reflects in the fact that when you submit a paper for peer review, it's often some, some journals find difficulty in finding reviewers. And this is because the pool is very small and it doesn't have to be this way. And also, uh, the composition of this pool is homogeneous. And, and, and so, for example, you don't see uh, many representation of different demographics. So they're mostly white males. We don't see uh, uh, Middle Easterns. We don't see Asians a lot. We don't see Africans. And uh, uh, they're mainly males. So we also don't, don't see uh, females. And we also, uh, reviewers are also uh, those that are uh, in the mid or uh, advanced career stages, we don't see a lot of early career re researchers as reviewers. So this is also a, a big problem. Uh, uh, and as I said, yeah, it's male, mid or late career uh, researchers. And one major issue is that when you become a reviewer, it's often that you don't receive any sort of formal training on how to do a review. It's something that you're sort of thrown into. Uh, you're just expected to know how to do it. 
if you're lucky, you will have a mentor that would uh, guide you through it. But th there has been a significant lack in, in formal training on how to do uh, peer review. And, and this is a big issue. And this results in the unsustainability, unsustainability and there, there becomes uh, no like standards or um, uh, guidelines that a person need to go uh, by for them to, uh, to, to, to write a review. And, uh, and, and, and this brings me to the fact that there are many benefits that comes uh, from early career researchers to get engaged in peer review. As we said, we see that most of the uh, of most of the reviewers are mid to late career stage researchers. But we're here to say that you, as an early career researcher, uh, will benefit a lot if you participate in open peer review. And and the reason that we don't see many early career researchers participating in open peer review could be attributed to the lack of confidence. They don't feel that they're up to it because uh, this has been the general understanding throughout the years. You have to be a mid or late career stage to be competent enough to do uh, a peer review. Uh, they're unfamiliar with the process. Again, we said that uh, there are no training, uh, formal training that's being done to researchers for them to come, in, to come peer reviewers. There is lack of recognition. Uh, we find in many cases, uh, for example, head of the lab would go and uh, uh, ask the early career researchers in the lab to do the peer review and then give them no credit uh, for this peer review. So this is also something that makes early career researchers think, think oh, why would I waste my time in, in peer review? There's also, again, the lack of mentorship and guidance, uh, which is a, a big issue. And when you actually engage in, in open peer review and what peer review is trying to do is that it's trying to build your skills as an early career researcher to give you the, the, the skill set that you need in order to become a good peer reviewer. And this, of course, will uh, help you gain more confidence. And it uh, it, it uh, it's trying to help you understand the publication process so that uh, the unfamiliarity with the process and what's happened is, is mitigated and you're more confident and knowledgeable about the publication process. And, and what uh, pre-review also is trying to do is to acknowledge you. You know, whenever you do a peer review, you are acknowledged for this uh, review. And you can uh, link it to your ORCID ID, you can put it on your CV, or you can share it uh, wherever you want. And, and this is a, a big plus. And uh, since, as we said, there's a lack of mentorship and guidance, it's, it's very good to be a part of the co a community that it engages with you and that empowers you and, in order to become a good uh, peer reviewer. And this is also what uh, peer review tries to do. And I would also like if you could go and, and read uh, this, this paper. It's why early career researchers should step up to the peer review plate. I think it's, it's very insightful and will give you even more uh, uh, reasons why early career researchers should become peer reviewers. So again, when, when, when we talk about peer review, uh, peer review, what it does is that it does open peer review for preprints. And so it's very important for us to define what a preprint is. So a preprint or preprints are a form of publication which enable pre-peer reviewed articles to be disseminated quickly and widely under open access license and usually at no cost to uh, the author. So preprints uh, are basically uh, the final manuscript that you would usually uh, submit to a journal, but instead of submitting it to a journal, you submit it to a preprint server, and there are many, many types of preprint pre -print servers. And uh, what happens is that uh, this manuscript will go for, uh, uh, for a, uh, a brief uh, or a short um, authentication step, you know, to make so the preprint server make sure that it's uh, legitimate and it, it fits the scope of the preprint server. And then within two days, it is published to the uh, whole wide world. And uh, most importantly, it will have a DOI. 
So it becomes uh, visible, it becomes citable, and you can put it um, in your uh, in your uh, grant application, for example. You can put it in your uh, job application or on your CV. So, and, and the idea is that, uh, and, and this brings me to the next slide, is that the traditional uh, publication system is very, very tedious and very, very lengthy. So if you can see that, uh, for example, you submit a manuscript to a journal and the journal uh, shows this manuscript to peer reviewers. And for example, usually three of them, like, and the three of them say, no, this paper shouldn't be published. So what you do is that you submit this to a second journal and it goes to a second round of peer review and they ask you to revise the manuscript. And maybe again, this journal, one of the reviewers say, no, uh, this, this uh, manuscript shouldn't be published. So you have to, pub to go to a third journal and go through the whole process. And if you're lucky, then the all the reviewers say that it's okay. And then finally, after months, months or years, then finally the paper is published and become available to the public. And, and mind that all of this process is done in the dark, you know, behind closed word, uh, doors, privately, no one knows about them. And this is the big issue. So what preprints does is that when you have your manuscript ready, you directly submit it to a preprint server. And uh, as I said, within one or two days, the preprint server will screen your, uh, your manuscript and it will make it publicly available uh, very fast in their server. So now you have um, sort of um, uh, cut the time that was on originally needed for a manuscript to uh, be published and be available for the, uh, for the whole world. And what this uh, helps in is that here when you have your preprint comes uh, the value of community feedback, idea, and discussion. So as soon as you have your work out there, the sooner it's available for the community, the sooner that the community would be able to review it and give you feedback uh, on your work and give you ideas and discuss their work and, and maybe even start new collaboration uh, to generate more uh, work that's built on your work. And also here comes the uh, role of uh, organizations such as peer review and society, and they help in gathering those uh, community feedback and discussion and community review in a form, uh, in, in a more organized form uh, that, uh, that is uh, linked to the uh, preprint that is published. So uh, one of the important things that happen or one of the biggest issue that happens in, in, the, in the process of peer review is that it's filled with many biases. And, 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 and this is one of the issues that uh, we at peer review like to focus on because bias is, uh, is a big, big problem in, in peer review. So bias is a disproportionate weight in favor or against an idea or thing usually in a way that is closed-minded uh, prejud uh, with prejudice and unfair. So this is the Wikipedia definition of bias. So I think, and we have to admit that all of us have biases and it's something that we experience in our day-to-day uh, -day life. So for example, if we look at this comic, uh, you can see uh, a scientist standing and uh, this scientist is in a statistics uh, conference and so, so all of the audience are statisticians and you find that the speaker asks them, raise your hand if you, you're familiar with selection bias. And of course, all of them are statisticians and all of them will raise their hand uh, because of course, statisticians know what selection bias is. So, so th this is an issue. This is a big issue that bias gives you a sort of skewed uh, view uh, of what's happening. It, it's not the true view, it's not the actual view, but it, it's a skewed uh, and unreal and unfair uh, view uh, of the situation that's happening. So uh, there are mainly two forms of bias uh, that we could, or we could categorize bias into two forms. We have implicit bias, and these are uh, prejudice, that turn into an action that is unconscious 
meaning that it occurs outside our perspective awareness. So these are some things that we cannot control. You know, these are biases that are so embedded into us that we sort of do them unconsciously uh, we or we act on them unconsciously without even realizing that we are implicating a, a bias. And also we have the second type, which is explicit bias. And this is exactly the opposite. It's it's a prejudice that turns into action, but this time it's conscious, meaning that it occurs with our perspective awareness, meaning that we are aware that we have this bias and we still choose to act on this uh, prejudice or this bias to have uh, as we are conscious about it. And 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 I think this is this is very important. It's very important for us to to take a moment with ourselves and uh, identify the biases that we have, whether they are explicit or implicit, because what happens is that these biases turn into action. And this action eventually could harm people. And, and this is what we don't want to happen, you know? And, and this is, we reflect this into peer review, you know? We don't want our prejudice, our uh, biases, to uh, be transformed in the form of action that would eventually uh, result, for example, in an unfavorable review to a manuscript, and that would eventually hurt or uh, uh, inflict uh, harm on the uh, author of this of this manuscript. That's why it's very important, as I said, for us to know where does bias come from and what are some examples of bias. And and here I would also like to. Uh, give you a small uh, chance to reflect on these questions. Where do you think biases come from? And what are some examples of biases that you could think of, especially biases that we usually see in, in, um, in the, in the uh, peer review process? So again, feel free to use the chat uh, to write if you have any idea or some example of biases. Or if you know, like, how how do we come to have biases in the first place? Anyone in the chat would like to contribute? Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, go so, ahead. Howard. Okay, thank you. So I think it's mostly uh come from the lack of knowledge maybe uh so as you said statistician they all raised their hand because they know the topic right it, this reminds me of uh, the topic of uh, deep learning or machine learning most people i mean so I don't know if it's the same for you, but I've I've lost the voice of Muhammad. Do you guys hear Muhammad? Ah, okay, Muhammad. Unfortunately, I think you're breaking up. We cannot really hear you. That's that's really sad. Oh, I think his connection was lost. Okay, so maybe when he comes back, we could uh, continue on this. But as I said, it's it's very important for us to know where biases come from. And I think Mohammed said lack of knowledge, and and I think this is very true. Uh, it's very important for us to know what is bias and be able to identify that bias. Uh, and so, so come to some examples of of biases that usually occur, occur in the in the peer review process or where biases hide in the peer review process. So, for example, we have the reputation of the author. If the of the author has a well known reputation, then they're more likely to get positive. Uh, uh, reviews. Uh, the ethnicity, we have the ethnicity and the race of the author 
also sometimes play a role in that. And uh, we see that, of course, if, if you have an author coming from, uh, for example, a European country, it, they're sometimes perceived to produce better science than someone coming from, uh, let's say, a country from the global uh, south. Gender, of course, also uh, uh, exist. We have uh, primary language and writing style. Uh, we sort of assume that everyone should be able to write perfect English. And we expect that uh, all publications are to be written in, 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 in perfect English. And this is not the case because not all authors are, are, um, are native English speakers. Uh, also reputation of the author institution. Uh, the country of origin and the number of authors uh, on the manuscript. These are all type of biases that sort of come to play within the peer review process. Uh, that it's important for us to, to know, identify and know how to deal with. So uh, where do these come from? Uh, unfortunately, these biases are rooted in our systematic beliefs that have been forged in our society throughout history. So these did not just come Overnight, these are systemic uh, beliefs that have been accumulating through years and years of, uh, of um, ideology that has been forged into our societies. So eventually it sort of became like a norm. And this brings us to what is known as the systems of oppressions. And systems of oppressions are thought to be the root of, of, of biases. And to define them, so these are discriminatory institutions, structures, norm, policies, and practices that are embedded into our society and used to prep oppress groups of people. So these are basically uh, all sorts of actions or uh, rules or beliefs that are have become part of our society. And unfortunately, these beliefs inflict harm to a group, and usually this group is a minority in, 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 in the society. So this is where all biases are, are rooted from, from these systems of oppression. An example of these systems of oppressions are racism, colonialism, patriarchy, ableism, cisgenderism. These are all uh, very well-known systems of oppression. Uh, so for example, we'll take racism as an example to, to, to explain how these systems of oppression operate. So if we want to talk about systematic racism, it means that we usually have to look at it from two perspectives, from our personal beliefs and our interactions, and from a bigger perspective, which is how our actions shape our society. And when we talk about the first part, which is our personal beliefs and interactions, the system of oppression, of racism, or any other oppression can manifest in two forms, either in a personal form, and this is basically our values, belief, and thoughts and prejudice, or and ideas that support racism. You know, this is basically, uh, uh, it, it, it's in, in ourselves, in our own selves, we have certain ideas, we have certain prejudice against certain groups that we believe are true, and unfortunately, these ideas support racism. So for example, uh, I come from, a, from Sudan, like an African country, and many people uh, around the world think that they have the belief that Sudanese people are lazy people. They are lazy, they are relaxed. So this is a belief that people have that support racism uh, against uh, a certain community. And then this personal uh, system can become interpersonal. And here, this idea, we did not keep this when we don't keep the idea to ourselves, but then we uh, expand uh, this idea and um, express it between individuals. So, so this is no more just an idea in our minds. Uh, this idea now starts to manifest in our actions and on the way that we treat uh, people. And then when we come to how our actions shape society, uh, we have, this could come in an institutional level. So we have an institution that has discriminatory uh, treatment policies or practices uh, within an organization or institution that support racism, okay? So for example, you work in a place and this place has 
certain policies and rules that discriminate against a certain group of people. And then this institutional uh, racism could grow to become structural racism. And this basically extend to, uh, to uh, engage the whole community. So these are historical, cumulative, and ongoing effects uh, of a system in which public policies, institutional practice, and other norms uh, perpetuate racial inequalities in, in the society as a whole. So it's, it's very important for us when we talk about bias and, and try to understand bias and, 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 and systems of oppression to sort of dissect this racism into these four different uh, categories, you know, for us to be able to understand it well and, and be able to act on it, you know, and able to mitigate these, uh, these systems of oppression. And of course, uh, one important thing is that these, these categories don't act alone, they interact together uh, so that they form the whole system of racism. So uh, what I would also like to say is that systems of oppression exist where there are people. You know, it's a human nature. It's something that is sort of built within us as humans is that we have some sort of systems of oppression within us, within our bringing, within our community. And the important thing is that we need to be aware of these systems of oppression. As, as Muhammad said, the knowledge is important. The knowledge is important before we could uh, start to change these systems of oppression. And going back to peer review, as we said, these systems of oppression manifest, unfortunately, in, in all aspects of life, of course, but here we're, we're interested in the peer review process. So for us to become uh, efficient peer reviewers and fair peer reviewers, we have to think about these systems of oppression and, and, and think about how our biases could act uh, and could harm others and how we can work to, uh, to mitigate this, uh, these biases. Hey, Femi, over to you. Um, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for participating in the first uh, part of the workshop. And uh, as Lami has addressed earlier, it's, it's you know, uh, systems of oppression exist everywhere. And uh, as a researcher, you we are not quite immune to the system, the system to understand. So it's everywhere and we must try our best to understand the concepts from when it comes to, several concepts when it comes to how to address this oppression and how to move forward when it comes to a peer review in academia and uh, other areas in uh, in your publishing. So let's move forward to the second part. Uh, and uh, that I will start with uh, how to you know, write in a review uh, step by step. So that has to do with, uh, we will we'll be looking at six steps in writing a review. And writing the first time can be really challenging, you know, but even more so to do it uh, objectively, you uh, even also to do it, you have to be objective about it. You have to be constructive and do it in a way uh, that is truly that will truly help the authors you know, improve on their work. So uh, we'll be looking at the real guide and uh, a link will be kind of uh, posted in the chat for you to access the real guide. So the real guide can be helpful to a student uh, learning to peer review or even to an experienced uh, review or looking to gain an understanding perspective. So it contains our uh, editor's tips, uh, contents from the PLUS Review Center and uh, other, an offer space to keep notes and keep track of our uh, progress. So uh, the reviewer guide breaks the process down into six steps. So the, the first step in the process, the first step in this process is to check uh, your internal beliefs and assumptions that you may have before even starting the review of the manuscript. So that is very important. And uh, I will describe this in more detail in a bit. But uh, we are referring to beliefs and social assumptions that are related to, for instance, uh, beliefs that are related to gender or the country that the author's uh, institution is located. So most of us, we, we know we are certainly not taught to do this as part of the review process. 
So we need to take a look into that when you are when you get when, if you are you know in the position of reviewing an author's manuscript. So the other thing we should focus on is the importance of you know uh, the importance of writing feedback. The importance of writing clear and constructive feedback. So uh, and I will describe this in more detail too. So the other thing you should focus on is writing. Uh, outside of this generally being a good practice, yeah, it is equally important when we consider the impact uh, destructive or unprofessional reviews uh, may have on researchers, and particularly from those from uh, marginalized communities. So those are the key uh, areas we should be looking at for if you start if you uh, if you want to know start to review a manuscript. So it's very 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 important to consider those uh, factors. So. Step one will be so now let's take a moment to look at uh, uh the bias reflection. So in, in the bias reflection guide, uh the link to which will be shared in the chat. Uh it's a tool to guide readers through a non-judgmental thought process of uh, self-reflection to evaluate your own biases and how they may impact the way you conduct a peer review, you know, as a reviewer. So uh we'll be looking at the idea how to method. And it has uh, four stages, and it has four stages. So we uh, the first is to the first stage is to identify and evaluate the potential bias. Then you move on to the second will be to add it to what to make it less overt. Then the third will be to reverse it to think of your deviations from this belief, and then rephrase the original statement, adjusting it in response to uh, to what you learned going through this reflection. So by the time, by making the time to pause and think through our biases in that process, we can usually find gaps you know, in the knowledge that we may need to uh, research for that. Or you know, simply find our initial belief, simply realize later on that our initial belief doesn't make, doesn't really make sense, you know, so we can update the belief along the line and you know, take a proper stance on you uh, and uh, in particular you know, or a particular manuscript you know, so. So let's take a moment to look at what it looks like in an example. So let's examine through the lens of the idea art to framework, an example of a common bias. An example of a common bias. So in this example, we are reviewing a research uh, manuscript and we recognize this author as someone you know who is at a late stage of their career. Then you know we catch ourselves realizing that we owe the belief because of what we, of, of what we think. They are likely to have a lot of domain expertise. Knowing this may help uh, helps me feel more confident in the quality of the uh, proposed research approach. But in the in the set, in that, that 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 when you look at that is is usually not true. When you look at it that way, you can actually you know uh, uh judge a papers or you know or a manuscript uh quality based on the expertise of the authors. You understand? So you have to be very sure of that. And very you have to take that into consideration when you are. If you're in a manuscript, so this 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 statement here, uh, so I'll repeat it again. It's like considering when the senior author is at the last stage of their career, and therefore is likely to be very experienced. So knowing this helps me feel confident in the accuracy and reliability of the data and conclusions. So that's one one of one example of a biased statement. You understand? So let's move forward. So first, let's dig a bit deeper into why. We or someone else may hold such belief. So we can ask ourselves, why do authors' years of experience lead me to, lead me to believe that uh, the anticipated results and impact of the research are more trustworthy? You know, you need to ask, we need to ask ourselves such questions when we are when we are reviewing a manuscript or uh, when we are reviewing a, a print. So where one answer may be. I know this author is renowned in my field, so I think uh, they probably do good science. So they will they wouldn't let bad science come from their lab, and therefore I think this is trustworthy, which is usually not the case when it comes to the green manuscripts. You can't base your you can't base your review of a particular manuscript uh, solely on the kind of lab or where the where the lab is situated or the kind of you know people working in the lab. You can't you can't survey that you can't base that. On your on your review, so something you need to actually consider when you are reviewing. So, so next we'll be looking 
for that, let, let to further evaluate this issue, we can also ask ourselves, uh, that's okay, is we can ask ourselves, is this logical? Like, you, you, you look at those bias, uh, uh, conditions that is this logical? Like, is there a rational that supports the notion that everyone equals uh, uh, that experience actually equals trust and equality of work? So, you need to consider that very well as a viewer. Uh, their years of experience and them having given the respect of the community may indicate to this study is likely to be you need to look into that too. And you, yeah, these are areas you need to consider. So, with this, uh, they are with the with their experience and their quality of work, they are two different things. Experience doesn't actually relate to uh, the quality of a particular you know, study. So, there are, there are two different things that you need to consider separately. So, let's move forward. Then we can add to the thoughts by asking, is this always true? Let's, uh, you know, please always guarantee these words, always guarantee and or, or never into the statement, you know. Let's try this in such a way that, okay, let's put it this way. The author is at a late stage of their career and therefore experience means their research is always trustworthy, accurate and reliable. So how, how does this sit with you? As, as a reviewer. So in most cases, making this statement so black and white you know, in that regard will make us to reflect on the things that truly matters and that the quality of work, the quality of the study, not the career of the of the of the of the authors, not the not their experiences, not their not their lab. You know, so these are the things you need to be careful of and you need to look into as a researcher. So moving forward, so at this point you you take a look at you take a look at the oh you know you reverse a bit and you look at it if it truly makes sense and at this point and if it makes sense for an example it may be useful to reverse the original statement so in this case you uh, somehow look at it like are there are situations that I can think of in which the years of experience would not quite influence you know, the quality of the author's manuscripts then uh, you look at it. This will be like okay. The senior author may may have not had time to revise the work, or you know, this may be enough for me to think. So they don't have experience with how best to kind of uh, analyze this data. So you look into that to to judge uh, your 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 level of uh review of the work. So then you proceed by you know you can now rephrase the original statement into the reflection. We just made. We can say that okay, although the author's experience and recognition in the field may actually correlate with you no know, sound um, rigorous experiments, data analysis, and conclusions, it is not something I can take for granted. That influence a manuscript's need for revision. So, uh, as as a reviewer, it's, it is important for you to remember that experience does not necessarily mean that the work, the work is not questionable or that. Uh, that it can be quick, that, or that you can actually be quicker at regulating the, you know, uh, the uh, evaluating the rigor of the work based on your perception or your view of the, you know, of the authors. So you don't actually uh, dive into into that. So you should always remember that so that you don't necessarily uh, uh, give reviews based on, based on your based on your own, you know, perception of this of the of the authors of the study. So let's let us move forward now. So now we can rephrase the original statement, taking into account the reflection we just made. So we, we can say that although the author's experience in the field may correlate with sound and rigorous experiments, it is not it is something that's not to be taken for. It's something not to be something I can not take for granted. You understand as a as a reviewer. So uh so now. We now move forward to the next step you know, on how to review the manuscript, uh, on, on how to review a manuscript. So the step two will be on how to gain a, concept, a conceptual understanding you know, of the manuscript, of the manuscript. So uh, when you look at reviewing a manuscript for, you know, for the first time or even for an experienced researcher, it may kind of seem obvious, but uh, what we recommend is that you first read the whole manuscript, focusing on understanding what the research is about. Then you look at the hypothesis, and uh, you look at the proposed approach of this of the study. Then the initial claims and the conclusions of the study. So, 
now that that now that you actually you know maybe when you've actually gone through all that then you can actually ascertain your own level of understanding of the manuscript so i am kind of uh, curious to know how many of you know you intentionally do this step or something similar before starting to evaluate a research manuscripts so you can actually uh, your you can use your term emoji to to show if you actually do that if you uh you know want to kind of review a manuscript So let's let's move forward then. So in, in your first uh in your first right through of the manuscript, you should try to you know avoid uh and instead focus on understanding you know what the old manuscript is all about. So evalu evalu evaluating evaluative and judgmental thoughts will give a bit of a pop up, but uh, you know understanding before evaluating can help us and mitigate the impact of our personal biases. Why you know you have to as a researcher you write down questions and you ever and evaluative thoughts so you can then focus on what the authors are trying to communicate and call back to them later on. So those are very 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 important uh, areas to consider to gain a very good conceptual understanding of the manuscript as a reviewer. So the goal during this step is not to look for plus but to quite understand uh, the content of the manuscript. Now, step step three uh, will be is to evaluate, appreciate, you know, and raise concerns after you, you give uh, after you gained a, a very good understanding of the manuscript. So for, for step three, you evaluate, you appreciate, and you raise concerns uh, on uh, of your of, of, and you raise concerns based on your your or your view of the of the manuscript. So in your in your second uh, retro. You can then begin identifying, you know, positive aspects of the research as well as, you know, uh, concerns you may have about the project goals, the research question, the approach, the authors use, the methods, you know, the results and the visual, the, the, the visualizations. Then later on, you look at the uh, figures and the uh, tables used to, uh, to uh, bring to kind of you know, analyze the, the the results. So those are the things you look at. For, do you look uh for in the in step three? So you evaluate, you appreciate, and you raise your concerns based on your review of the manuscript. So now we move forward. So you may you may have seen uh how sometimes concerns are presented in a as a major you know as a major uh, as a major uh, or core you know uh, issue in in a manuscript review or even as a researcher you might have you know. Your manuscript might have been reviewed, and there might be major and minor concerns where you they tell you to address those things. So when uh, when you look at when you when you look at that, you have to those are things you need to address as a as an author when when they when they tell you to do that. So when you are when we are looking at major concerns, so cons these are concerns the authors need to address before the manuscript is recommended for a journal publication, and Concerns that if left unaddressed could kind of interpretation of the study. So now we look at what the minor uh, concerns are. So the concerns, the minor concerns are usually the kind of concerns that the authors should uh, consider addressing to improve uh, readability of the manuscript and general comprehension of the manuscript. So these concerns, that these are concerns that if you kind of you know uh, if they are left unaddressed would not affect the interpretation of the study, but they are also good uh, areas to kind of address. You understand? So, as I, as as a, uh, the reviewers will kind of uh, give you the provide you know list the major concerns and the minor concerns of the manuscript. So, and as a as an author, these are the things you you need to kind of uh, uh, address. So, as with every categorization, there is no 
there is, there is no perfect. As with every categorization, whether minor or you know, major, it's it's there is no perfect way to look at it, and you just have to be objective about it. So, however, thinking about your concerns under this lens can help. Can help a lot, and actually, you know, uh, help the way you kind of you know give your views. Uh, for the for the uh, you you present your your concerns and you know major or minor concerns for the authors to to address. So, I mean, we seem to have gone back to the beginning of the presentation. Yeah, it's okay. Can you, can you see that? Yes. So, uh, as as I said earlier, my concern. Then, uh, this is so we let let's look at you know, uh, examples of major concerns when it comes to uh uh when it comes to the part of uh the. When, when we are looking at the reviewers' uh, perspective, so these are the kind of major concerns that might get uh, listed for the authors to kind of consider. So first, the unethical approach to research questions, uh, data collection and analysis, then uh, followed by conclusions that are not supported by the data provided. Then uh, it, it, you know, to kind of include the contradictory conclusions, then those are, okay, contradictory conclusions, not accounting you know, and not appropriate discussions for of study limitation and majorly uh they, they to kind of contain confounding variables that you know can affect uh the results so those are uh, those are the, the the major concerns that you that you might you know that you might find in after that you might find when it comes to reading my manuscript so issues with experimental design also uh including insufficient sample size of data, improper controls, improper methodology, and you know, uh, improper statistical analysis can be raised when it comes to you know, uh, giving out the major concerns about a particular manuscript. So those are the uh, major concerns that, those are, those, those are the major concerns that you know, a reviewer might raise and for the authors to, to kind of consider. So let's move forward now. So other, other concerns, other common concerns are, uh, technical clarifications, such as the author should clarify how a reagent works. You understand? So, and aside that, uh, some other clarifications might be for the authors to provide uh, the name of a particular, uh, the name of a of an equipment that that was used in the in the, in the process of the research in the study. So they might even ask the authors to provide the kind of the version of the equipment. So. Those are the technical clarifications that they may ask under ask the uh, authors under the minor concerns. So then, uh, followed by it can be they can include uh, things like uh, data presentation or visualizations. They can you know it can include typos, spelling, grammars, and phrasing issues, and uh, missing or wrong referencing. So those are the minor concerns that uh, a reviewer a reviewer might kind of raise for the authors to address. So while it may be ten. Tend to kind of focus on grammatical errors, you know, sentence structure and choice of words. Remember that uh, you, as a reviewer, you are not uh, a copy editor, and spelling or grammar or poor research is not your major concern as a reviewer. So you need to be very, uh, you need to quite take that into full consideration, you know, when you're reviewing a manuscript. So this is very, very, very important. And it is also important to keep it in mind that. Manuscript authored by researchers whose are uh, you know uh, whose English whose language is not English would like they are not native speak, uh, speakers I mean so the interpreting language mistakes as as a reviewer it's, it shouldn't be your core your core your core uh, area of your core focus when you are reviewing manuscripts you understand so you shouldn't let that core override your 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 important. Uh, your, your, your goal as a, as a reviewer, your goal should be to evaluate the quality of the manuscript, not focusing entirely on, you know, kind of minor concerns that has to do with grammar and, you know, uh, spelling and things like that. So let's move forward. 
So I will pass the mic over to Fanny. Um, so um, just to say on the, on the previous slide that Fanny was talking about, um, with the language issues, one of the um, issues that we worked through during the IDR2 method uh, was the issue of um, that the, this person's um, language seems to appear that they're, you know, they're maybe not a native speaker of English. So you might notice some grammatical errors, some spelling errors, or some phrasing that doesn't quite sound right. And to associate that with necessarily bad signs, that is a, a sort of bias in itself. Um, so it's things to take into account as you're reading a manuscript. There might still be things to put in minor feedback or things that affect readability, um, which can really hinder understanding of science. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the experiments itself are wrong or that their science is bad. Okay, so moving on to step four. Um, so here we're going looking at giving constructive, clear and actionable feedback. So as we said, on your second read through, you begin to identify, take notes of some concerns that you might have with the manuscript. But your review doesn't shouldn't be a list of things that you just believe are wrong. But as much as possible, you should try to make sure that you, um, for each concern that you raise, it should be associated with some examples of how you can improve it um, and how they the how the authors can improve it to make it um, better and that your feedback should be as clear, constructive and actionable as possible. And it's more likely then to land well and have a positive impact with the person receiving it as well. So clear feedback as it's more likely to be interpreted correctly, constructive as it's more likely to be well received and able to be used, and actionable so your feedback's more likely to be integrated. And importantly here, constructive doesn't mean positive. We should be as critical as we need to be, but in a way that the reader understands why we're saying this and is best positioned to be able to address that concern that you've raised. And finally, also actionable doesn't mean that reviewers should not raise a concern unless you're able to provide the right answer. Um, the action could also be to consult with experts in that field, and that doesn't necessarily need to be you. And let's look at an example of this together. So we can imagine here that we're reviewing a manuscript, and one of the concerns that we've identified in step three is that we believe that a particular statistical test has been improperly used in the research. So this is a, a true example, by the way. Um, one clearly wrong way to be able to concern, um, to um, write this concern would be something like this. So the author should go back to Statistics 101. So needless to say, this is kind of destructive feedback. It's not useful. Um, it's quite lazy feedback. It's not clear. It's not actionable. And it's actually even quite insulting on a personal level because you're kind of insulting the, um, the author's education there. Um, so let's look at a better way in which we could convey the same concern. So here it's obviously quite a bit like longer because it does require more um, length and more effort to be able to provide feedback that is more clear, constructive and actionable. And we can use a method uh, using interpretation, reason, recommendation and depersonalization. So here we've got uh, interpretation. So the data presented in this manuscript appear to be highly skewed to the left. So that's our interpretation of what this is. Then we have reasoning. So this type of distribution requires, you know, a non-parametric version of whatever this test is, which makes no assumption on the parameters of the distribution of the data. Then we have a recommendation. So the parts that are in yellow, I suggest the, the use of test Y. Um, and, you know, I recommend to explicitly mention that in the method section. Um, you can also then use some depersonalization here. So instead of saying um, the author should do this or the, the author did this wrong, you can say statistical test X is typically used for this, or if the choice of test X is, used, is motivated by this particular strategy. So here you're making it less personal and more about the science itself and how they can improve it rather than doing something that might feel um, like you're attacking the author themselves. So I'm not going to read through the whole um, example. It's there on the screen for you to be able to read through. Um, but here is just a way in which you can make sure that you provide feedback that is going to land well with the authors, that's going to provide them ways in which they can improve their work, um, along with reasonings for why you think that way and recommendations for what they can do next. And here we've got a couple more examples of unconstructive feedback um, and how this can potentially cause harm. Um, not only is it useless for the receiver, but it can cause harm for the authors, um, particularly if they're belonging to marginalized communities. 
So here we've got a group of researchers who conducted an international survey targeting researchers in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and maths. And it was an anonymous survey of international participants. And it aimed at investigating the pervasiveness and the author perceptions of peer, unprofessional peer reviews. And the types of unprofessional comments that people reported uh, were kind of comments like this. So this paper is simply manure, or what the authors have done is an insult to science or even more personal attacks, such as uh, the author's status as a trans person has distorted his view of sex beyond the biological reality. Or the author's last name sounds Spanish. I didn't read the manuscript because I'm sure it's full of bad English. So you might find some of these examples quite shocking, but these are actual examples um, that people gave uh, as reviews that they have received. Um, as you can probably guess, these are not very useful. There's nothing here that people can do to improve their work. They're quite offensive. And not only that, but it shows that the, the unconstructed feedback um, is not only just a reality in the scientific space, but it does have a long term impact on those people who are receiving it. Um, so authors in the study found that those who are from traditionally underrepresented groups in STEM were more likely to perceive their negative impacts on their scientific aptitude, productivity and career advancement after receiving an unprofessional review. Um, and this just underscores the importance of training geared towards this type of understanding the impact of bias and systemic oppression in the context of peer review. So um, do we have any questions about this, this step or any comments that anyone would like to make before we move on to step five? Just gonna check the chat as well. Yeah, thumbs up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Our last couple of steps are quite short. Um, but here's step five. We're going to pull everything we've done together up to this point. So all of the notes that we've made as we've been reading it into our final review. So although there's no one universal type of review format, it's useful to have one in mind to help you guide the writing. And it might look at it in just a simple way of structuring your review kind of like this. So you might have the most important information at the top. So like a, maybe a summary of the research and the overall impression that you have followed by more details and examples in the center with any evidence and examples that you want to include, and any additional points at the bottom, any miscellaneous remarks that you might have, making sure that you make sure that your, your feedback at any point is as clear and constructive as it can be. And then finally, in step six, we're gonna check your review and then share it. So you reread your review, take it from a high level lens and read it from the perspective of the person receiving the review not you as a reviewer. So thinking about step one, the beliefs and assumptions that you've identified in yourself, did you manage to keep those in mind and mitigate how they may have affected your judgment? Thinking about step three, does your review highlight strengths as well as weaknesses of the study? In step four, does your feedback sound as constructive, clear and actionable as it can be? And then finally, does your review read well from the summary to the end? And does anyone have any questions? Those are our six steps of the reviewer guide. Um, obviously, we shared the link earlier. We'll happily share any links um, again with you after today via email. Um, but you can read more about how to do this um, on your own. We do have a, a demo that you can use uh, to go through the process on the pre-review platform. So if you'd like to know how to use the pre-review platform, I'm not going to go through it today just in the interest of time. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time um, in leaving today. but Chad has kindly recorded a demo for us of using the pre-review platform. So if you're interested in knowing how to review via pre-review, it's quite a simple um, platform. You can easily just uh, get a DOI of a paper that you would like to review, paste it in, and then it gives you a variety of different ways in which you can provide your feedback. So if you've already written a review and you want to publish it on the pre-review platform, you can simply copy and paste it in. There is a, a basic template that looks very much like the one we just shared with a summary section, um, main concerns, minor concerns, and general marks at the end. Or there's also a structured review, which will take you through a series of questions to provide feedback to a manuscript. You also have the opportunity on peer review um, to be able to have your um, peer review work recognized. So if you want to sign up to a peer review, you just need an ORCID identifier. And if you allow us, uh, give us the permissions, we're happy to automatically update your ORCID profile with any peer review activity that you do on peer review. So we'd like to be able to recognize the work that people do. 
So what you can do next after today? As I've just said, please do create an account on Preview.org and join our community if you're not already there. Uh, fill in your profile, you can tell us what types of things that you would like to review. Start reviewing, so as I've said, copy and paste in your review, fill in a basic template, follow our prompts. You can look into further training such as this for your own organization or your community. Join a pre-review club. So we have these collaborative reviewing groups. Um, so there's a number of them that are already open for you to join, or you can also start your own. Um, join our Slack community where we have lots of conversations about open peer review and open science in general. And we also have uh, things like a bi-monthly newsletter and we're on lots of different social media channels if you'd like to follow us and keep up with our updates and news. We also have a live review that's going to be running uh, next week on Thursday, the July 18th. So if you would like to join and put some of these skills into practice that we've covered today, um, we'll be reviewing a preprint together. Um, this time usually takes about 90 minutes. Um, we get together online. We go through a series of questions to provide feedback to a preprint, being as constructive, clear, and actionable as we can be. And you have the opportunity to be recognized for your work and credited um, as a review author. So if you'd like to sign up to that, uh, the link is posted in the chat, I believe. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, we'll also share news about this via email when we follow up with you. Um, and the final thing to say is that we work really welcome any feedback that you have on our workshop today. So there is a post workshop survey. Um, and I see that Femi has posted the link to that in the chat. It's the last link there that you can find. Um, we do welcome your feedback. We really want to improve how we do these workshops. So please let us know. Um, after the um, after the workshop form, you will have the option to go to a separate form where you can add your name and email address if you would like to receive a certificate of participation. So the actual post workshop survey itself is anonymous, but if you would like to receive a um, post workshop certificate, then you can do so by following the link at the end of the survey. And finally, we just have um, some links there at the end if you'd like to join our community, uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, so please do feel free to do that.